everyone and welcome back to the channel. This week's video takes us near the village of Tisbury and west of Salisbury towards one of the Nadder Valley's best kept secrets, the magnificent Old Wardour Castle. Today the unusual hexagonal ruins of Old Wardour stand serenely in their lakeside setting, protected by acres of wood. This was not always the case and the ruin testifies to bitter disputes in the past. So why not join us whilst we explore and discover Old Wardour Castle? Recorded in the Doomsday Book of 1086, the Manor of Wardour was modest by most standards, only covering 180 acres of land. Apparently the Kings of Wessex in around the year 900 occupied the site, and Alfred the Great gave judgement in the chamber there. Some sort of manor must have therefore existed at Wardour since that time, but where it was, how large it was, and where it was situated is still unknown. But by the time of the Norman Conquest, it had been granted to Wilton Abbey, a Benedictine nunnery about 10 miles away. Eventually, ownership passed by right of marriage to John and Maud Lovell, who owned vast estates throughout England, including Minster Lovell, their ancestral home. We have in fact visited Minster Lovell, and if you have a look in our description box for the link, it will take you to that walking tour. When John Lovell acquired Wardour, he decided to rebuild it on a grand scale, and in 1393 received the necessary licence to crenellate. Castles were often used for military purposes, located and designed to resist ongoing attacks or sieges, and would dominate a major road, town or river crossing. But they were also lived in, and very often by a great person or persons, and their family and so they would acquire two distinct connotations, both military and social status. England was in fact at peace when Wardour was built, but the political situation was doubtful and uneasy enough to call for some degree of security. This included an entrance protected by a portcullis and projecting towers for flanking fire. But despite their military form, these features were intended to show off and announce the presence of a great man, and possibly the greatest in Wiltshire too. Weirdly, the castle made little sense in terms of fortification. The castle is set in a beautifully secluded place, with no military importance. There is a variety of openings all around the hall. Two 14th century doors at the eastern end lead into more of the service rooms. One that we enter inside is the buttery and servery. Both of these rooms would act as a server. A buttery, or more modern loan, now as a butler, would have been kneaded and handed beer that was brought up from the beer cellar downstairs, and the dishes would be passed through the still existing hatch from the kitchen next door. The walls in front of us show us huge fireplaces needed for all of the cooking, that was prepared and cooked here. In the wall you can still see the remains of a brick lined oven and in this fireplace you could expect the cauldron suspended above the fires and a roasting spit for all of the various meats. The door in the corner of the servery opens out onto the grand kitchen which is three stories high and lit by two tall 14th century windows seen from the courtyard. Wardour Castle remained in the hands of the Lovell family up until 1461 when Edward IV ordered the seizure of the Lovell estates in retaliation for John Lovell's support of the Lancastrian cause during the Wars of the Roses. This John Lovell was the great-grandson of the John Lovell who built the castle 70 years earlier. In 1547, Sir Thomas Arundel from Cornwall purchase Wardour Castle, and it remained the property of the Arundels up until its demise after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. 
Almost 75 years later, Wardour Castle and its occupants were threatened with the stability of the emerging parliamentary government, despite its weakened defences. In late April 1643, a force of some 1,300 men, led by Sir Edward Hungerford and General Edmund Ludlow, besieged the castle. In an effort to reduce Lord Arundel's influence with the King. With her husband engaged elsewhere, and despite only having 25 troops and some household staff to help her defend her home from the parliamentarians, Lady Blanche Arundel refused to surrender. For eight long days she withstood the ambush and thankfully the attacker's small cannons inflicted only minor damage to some windows and chimney piece. Finally, Hungerford ordered his men to plant gunpowder mines underneath the castle walls. They laid one in the service tunnel that led directly to the cellars underneath the eastern side of the main entrance and another in the base of a latrine chute that drained the private apartments. Incredibly, the building resisted the explosions, but the garrison persuaded Lady Blanche to surrender on May the 2nd. Ludlow and his parliamentarian troops promptly moved into the still very livable castle. In December of 1643, Henry, the new third lord and heir to the Arundel estate, led a royalist assault on Wardour determined to reoccupy his family home. Unlike the siege earlier in the year, this battle raged for several months, pounding by cannons broke windows and gouged the walls. But the castle remained strong up until mid-March of 1644, when Arundel ordered his men to lay gunpowder mines. Yet, unlike the assault the previous May, this time the royalist mines devastated the castle. Apparently, one of Ludlow's men unwittingly tossed a match into the tunnel, where a mine lay hidden. The resulting explosion ripped a gaping wound in the rear of the building and destroyed the upper floors of the castle. General Ludlow was asleep at the time and was forced to single-handedly defend what was left of his bedchamber until his men could reach him. After four days, the threat of more mining and their increasing hunger forced the parliamentarians to admit defeat. Henry, Lord Arundel, had regained control of his castle, but had unintentionally destroyed it in the fray. After the parliamentarians finally gained control of the government, not only did they execute Charles I, but they also seized the Arundel estate at Wardour. The family moved to Hampshire, but later in the century, they began a new building program at Wardour. Rather than rebuilding the castle, they opted to remodel the outbuildings and for a time lived in the renovated stable block. Life was fairly comfortable, for they not only made use of the brew house and banqueting house, but they also had a fine bathhouse, an orchard and lavish gardens to keep them going. This is the irony that thanks to the royalist Henry, this is one castle that we can't blame Oliver Cromwell for spoiling. During the 18th century, the Arundels built New Wardour, which is visible slightly in the distance. They hired the famous landscape architect Lancelot Brown to transform the grounds and several lakes and a new banqueting house, which soon appeared in the shadows of the ruins. In the 19th century, Old Wardour Castle became a popular destination for visitors who enjoyed the romanticism of ruins, and in 1944 it was taken over by the state when the last Lord Arundel died. Today Old Wardour remains a really stunning ruin. At the northern end of the property, two unusual features complete the lingering impression of a romantic era long since past. An 18th century stone grotto serves as a nesting place for birds, whilst the remains of a prehistoric stone circle hide in the woodland behind the English heritage shop.
From the kitchen and the service rooms, you can take the stairs in the East Tower to rooms of the second, third and fourth floors, now with concrete flooring. The windows shed such beautiful natural light throughout the castle, but originally the rooms were more than likely plastered or lime washed, making it very light. The second floor room has a fireplace, but it didn't contain a latrine, which suggested that this was not used for lodgings as such, but it may have been a wardrobe of types and could have been a cosy room where the servants would be able to repair fabrics of wall hangings or cushions rather than clothing. An archway on the left of the Great Hall leads past the staircase to a Great Chamber Room. The Great Chamber Room came with the utmost importance from the 14th century beyond. It became a place where the Lord chose to eat his meals away from the household in the main hall. At Wardour, the Great Chamber rose two stories high, as does the Great Hall, again showing off the elegance and wealth that the castle had. It must have been elegantly decorated, but little remains today. This medieval great chamber became the Elizabethan Great Parlour, a type of room that served as a common room, in which the family and their upper servants would be able to meet, gossip, play cards and a game of backgammon, and some of the ladies would be able to embroider too. The castle once had more than a dozen bedchambers that were arranged in suites for the family, guests and senior staff. Many of those chambers and rooms were destroyed, though, in the Civil War. Most of the lodgings were on the upper floors, again complete with a fireplace, large windows to gaze from, private latrines, and some even contained a separate inner chamber. Most richly decorated, with various paintings and wall hangings, but an inventory from 1605 revealed that the lodgings were more decorated than once thought. The rooms had tapestries from Northern Europe and beautiful rugs from Turkey or the Middle East. Guests would have been able to indulge in a good night's sleep on feather beds underneath satin quilts. Two archways from the right of the grand entrance gave access to two different rooms. Originally vaulted, the one at the north has no fireplace and was almost certainly a wine cellar in the Elizabethan times and during stages of the medieval period as well. Wine was classed as a luxurious drink for the upper classes and wine cellars were often used very frequently in places like Wardour. Beer for the main household would have probably been stored in the other room. An opening on the north side of one of the rooms, which is now unfortunately barred up, looks down into two small cellars at a lower level. These once gave access to an underground tunnel that is now blocked up, that led from the castle to the outside. During the 1990s, the castle was the setting for the movie Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, starring Kevin Costner and Morgan Freeman. You'll be able to spot the two towers of the castle in a brief scene in the official trailer, but it's no wonder that they filmed a great classic movie in the stunning setting here. The grotto of Old Wardour Castle was the last addition to the landscape. It was built in 1792 by Josiah Lane of Tisbury, who at the time was a well-known builder of garden ornaments and other grottos in the area. He was commissioned to build the artificial cave, complete with dripping water, fossils and ferns from brick, plaster and stone from the ruins of the castle. 
The grotto and related structures also incorporates three prehistoric stand-in stones, thought to be removed from the stone circle at Tisbury as part of a larger stone circle or chambered tomb, but unfortunately no other trace remains. We spent such a great amount of time really exploring and enjoying Old Wardour Castle. It's one of those places you find yourself completely drawn to. We have actually been here a few times now, and with each visit we learn and enjoy something new. So if you've enjoyed the video, please be sure to hit that like button. Consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, and why not consider supporting us over on our Patreon, or join us as channel members to hear first on what we do next. We're very excited to say a massive welcome and thank you to our two newest Patreons, Kitty and Suzanne. We're excited to have you as part of the PIM family. So we'll see you in the next one. Till next time.